Now we've come to one of the most interesting parts of the course, at least for me, hopefully for you. We're starting to talk in more detail about the human brain. And we've already mentioned a few things about the human brain, that it is a pinkish gray color, that it's surrounded by the cerebral spinal fluid, so it looks moist inside the skull. And when you look at the human brain, you're basically looking at the outermost covering of the brain called the cerebral cortex. This is the newest part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective, and it is very wrinkled or convoluted inside the skull. In fact, if you were to remove the cerebral cortex and sort of smooth it out on a table, it would be about two feet by three feet. Again, the cerebral cortex is the newest part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective, and you definitely need to know that. When you look at a drawing of a human brain, I also want you to know which is the front and which is the back. The human cerebral cortex is divided into parts called lobes. And we're going to be talking about the different lobes of the human brain, of the cerebral cortex, and you will need to know the functions of each. Looking at this diagram, you can see some important landmarks. One is the central fissure, and the second is the lateral fissure. A fissure is an inward fold, and these fissures serve as landmarks if someone is undergoing brain surgery, then the surgeon can, to some extent, know what part of the brain is where. In this diagram, you're looking at the left side of a human brain, and you can see that the central fissure is going across the top, and it goes down the other side of the brain. You can also see the lateral fissure. Lateral means side, and so the lateral fissure is on each side of the brain. And we're going to talk about the frontal lobe first. It's no surprise that it is located at the front of the brain. And the frontal lobe is responsible for planning and movement. For instance, the frontal lobe is involved in high-level executive cognitive abilities. For instance, planning ahead in a multi-step process to achieve some goal. Uh, imagine me trying to make a cake. Not going to happen, I'm sure. <laughs> but if I were to do that, I'd have to make sure I had all the appropriate pots and pans. I had to have all the ingredients. I would have to find a recipe. I'd have to follow the recipe step by step. And so, you know, there are multiple steps involved achieving that goal. And I do envy those of you who can cook and bake cakes and do all those sorts of things. I, maybe I'll do it when I retire. At any rate, frontal lobe, planning, and movement. We'll talk about movement as a function later on. First, I want to show you an image of an individual who experienced severe damage to his frontal lobe. This is a drawing illustrating the case of Phineas P. Gage, who is very famous in the history of psychology. On September 13, in 1848, in Vermont, Phineas P. Gage was in a railroad accident. He was actually the foreman of a railroad crew, and that morning a tamping iron, a metal iron bar, was shot across the, the railroad yard and it struck Phineas P. Gage in the face. Specifically, it entered through his cheek and then exited up through his brain. And you can look at this drawing and you see what part of the brain was actually damaged in this accident. It was obviously the frontal lobe. Phineas P. Gage recovered from the accident, but he wasn't really the same person he was beforehand. He was still able to speak, he was still able to walk and move through his environment, but people who knew him said he underwent a personality change, and he in fact lost his position as foreman at the railroad yard. Phineas P. Gage was no longer able to plan ahead and assign tasks to the men who worked for him. People who knew him said he began to behave quite differently socially, that he seemed to have lost his inhibitions making inappropriate comments or jokes in front of women, which you didn't do in the 1800s. So a very different type of behavior following the accident. This was the result of damage to the frontal lobe. And it's case studies like this that let us understand to some extent the various functions of the brain. Now obviously today there are many other techniques other than waiting for someone to be in an accident, monitoring their behavior afterward, 
and then looking at the site of damage during an autopsy when they die later of natural causes. There are many other techniques for studying the brain today, but this was a very famous case in the history of psychology. We learned a great deal from Phineas P. Gage's situation.